Hello and welcome to this edition of Credit Matters TV. I'm Simon Collingridge and today I'll be talking to Carlo Fuchs, Senior Director in our Covered Bonds Group. Carlo, today we're going to be talking about some rating actions that have been recently on a number of multi-cedulars in Spain. Perhaps before we start, you can explain to me exactly what a multi-cedular is and how it differs from a, a normal covered bond or indeed a, a cedular itself. Yeah, sure. Thanks for having me here. Um, when we normally talk about the covered bonds, um, we normally see covered bonds being issued by single um, issuers by an institution where a majority of the funding might be comprised by, by that um, instrument. Um, Covered bonds are the most senior instruments. Um, they have a preferential treatment um, because they, they do benefit from a dual recourse. First the claim on the bank and then recourse to the collateral. So that's why investors typically like them. Um, also the issue is they do like them um, because typically they are able to get some quite attractive funding rates using the covered bonds. Um, so, uh, and also, of course, we've seen that um, in the wake of the, of the crisis, covered bonds actually have fared quite well, and whereas most other segments of the funding markets, of in particular the wholesale funding market, had shut down, uh, we've seen that investors were still willing to buy into covered bonds. And that is because even though in covered bonds uh, we have changing risk profiles over time, also, um, the issuers there, they do accommodate um, the changing risk profiles by actually mitigating the risks by adding over collateralization. So this happens in a normal covered bond. When we look now into Spain, uh, we see here actually two main types of covered bonds um, that have been issued by the banks. First, the normal settlers, either settlers hypothecarias or the settlers territorialis, which are those plain normal covered bond types. However, given that in Spain you have a large um, segment of small institutions, um, the Cajas, we've seen that they actually have teamed together and have um, used a different breed of covered bond, which is so-called multi settlers So here the difference is that it's not only one bank that has been issuing the bond, but rather a couple of banks have issued small-sized covered bonds, have packed them together, and have then issued one large covered bond against that. So basically, they are more akin to a normal, um, to a, almost a CDO of ABS, because here it's a repack. Actually, also, um, in contrast to a normal cover bond, where we typically see um, asset liability mismanagement risk, here, given that they are a repack of already issued cover bonds, here um, it's a matched funding. However, um, this matched funding typically benefits from an extension period, and in that extension period, um, this results from the fact that, of course, here also the issuer could default, and if it defaults, you need some mitigation to actually continue to ensure the timely payment. And that is um, provided by way of a, a liquidity line or a reserve fund. So, um, and here, obviously, one of the main differences um, in that credit protection is that in the plain covered bonds, you see a dynamic over collateralization and also a dynamic pool. In contrast thereto, um, the multi settlers are static. They are done on an opportunistic basis with a set number of banks and they only benefit from a static level of credit enhancement. Hence, this means if there are changes um, in the risk profile, obviously the credit enhancement has already upfront to be sized in order to mitigate for potential shortfalls. Okay, so that's given us a very useful background to the, to the differences mm. between multi cedulars and other types of covered bonds. But let's go back now to, mm. to what's happened recently and the, and the rating changes. Mm. Can you talk a bit about the range of those rating changes, how many, how many programs have been mm. affected and the extent of those rating changes? Yeah. yeah, we actually had still 48 programs left on Credit Watch. And when we now resolved the Credit Watches, all but two actually got downgraded. The downgrades actually had been quite significant. Uh, they could have been as high as nine notches. When we actually look at the details, which of course can be found in the detailed uh, press releases um, that we have done to that respect, we've seen that about 37% um, have moved down into the double A category, um, about 40% have moved into the single A category, and also there is still some 16% that have moved down into the double B category, into the, the triple B category, which is quite a significant move. But of course, you need to be aware that also at the same time, um, also, um, the, the sector of the 
um, financial institutions in Spain and the whole Spanish economy, of course, has gone through um, a quite severe um, time of stress. So there is no surprise that actually there had to be some changes. Okay, well, that's, having said that, that, some of those changes are quite significant. So perhaps we can look at that in a bit more. You've talked about some mm. of the, the wider macroeconomic issues, but in terms of the multi sectors themselves, what have been the drivers to these rating changes and the extent of those mm. rating changes? I think the most obvious one is that there had been changes to the creditworthiness of the issuers. Um, so as mentioned before, um, the multi settlers are um, a repack of uh, several small cajas. So uh, when we look at the, at the segment um, of the cajas, we've seen here quite significant moves and quite significant also involvement of the, of the government to restructure the whole segment and we've seen a lot of mergers going on, either voluntary ones or, for, or forced mergers. So this is clearly the driver. However, um, in, the, in the way we look into um, the multi settlers, those deteriorations that on average had been somewhere between two and yeah, two notches about, um, we've seen um, that these movements had been amplified by the way we actually have sized um, the, the credit enhancement. Um, and um, just to give an example, um, the car sector has seen quite a significant concentration. So uh, when we look at individual transaction then, this means that the number of participants can have reduced quite significantly. So the impact of an individual default um, has now a much larger impact than before and therefore this can result in an impact on the, on the size of the liquidity line. There are also other factors that, as mentioned before, there had been these, um, these SIPs, these forced mergers, and, um, and as a result of those mergers, typically also the balance sheets have increased. Also in our, in our analysis, this has an impact, because we assume that the larger um, the balance sheet of the issuer is, the longer it might take actually to work out the bank to bring it back um, into the market. So this means that by comparing the, the past to now the present, uh, you might need a longer period to cover for and therefore it can well be that the liquidity line sized up front actually is no longer commensurate because now you need to cover a much longer period and this of course can result in situations where this liquidity line no longer has been commensurate. Okay, that's, you, you spoke there a bit about concentration, you know, following on from the mergers, mergers mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. Can you illustrate what you mean by that? How extensive has that concentration been? The concentration has been quite significant. When we looked at the 48 transactions um, that had remained on Query Watch, uh, we've seen that the number of participants in those transactions initially had been about 60. Um, by now, this has reduced to about 36 if we assume that those mergers have already been concluded. Actually, the majority of the participants had been Cajas, and in the Cajas sector, um, the number of institutions that um, had been that are still around has even halved. So to illustrate that number, um, the number of initial participants was about 44 and now assuming that the mergers all go as planned, we only will have, we'll see about 20 of, of, of cajas left. So it has been quite a significant concentration that has been going on. Okay, so you've talked here about a number of factors. You've talked about the macroeconomic issues. You've talked about the concentration. Mm. You've talked about some of the pressure on the cars themselves, mm. some of the underlying assets, uh, you know, performance issues mm. there. But you know, I have to ask you the question: these these multi tedulars were placed on Credit Watch almost 11 months ago. Now, you mm. know, why the rating change at mm. this point? I think that's a fair question, um, but. Um, it took us quite a while because obviously we were revisiting the assumptions um, that, that, that we had taken. Um, with, the, with the introduction of the SIPs, we, we had to take new views on, on how actually we had to size the correlation. Um, and, um, and also, uh, you have to bear in mind that actually, in particular in the period of um, late 2010 and, and 2011, there had been quite some movement in the financial institution sector. Actually, our financial institutions colleagues, they do provide us with either the ratings or the credit estimates that are the basis um, of our analysis. Um, they, of course, have had to include the developments, and the developments had been quite, um, quite dramatic. Actually, um, just about a week ago, uh, one, of the, uh, one, of, one of the participants in the transactions, um, um, a, a caja called CAM, um, has been uh, bailed out by the Spanish government and, um, and, and, and therefore, of course, if we want to have our, 
our ratings current, um, of course, we need to take into account all those developments. And uh, clearly, our colleagues in the financial institution side have also tried to be forward-looking in order to, to look at what's going to happen in that sector. And actually, in their view, um, I think the, the deterioration that has happened um, has really um, come to, to uh, a standstill. They have tried to already reflect in the assumptions that we have used, um, the challenges that are lying ahead from them. So I think um, uh, we can assume that um, from, from this input factor, we're pretty much in a stable state now. Uh, we wouldn't expect any, any material changes to the credit estimates um, um, in, the, in the course of the next months. Okay. Let me still press you on this a bit, if I may. So, 11 months from the placement on Credit Watch to, to the action, and also mm. some, as you described, so, some fairly extensive um, you know, downgrades in terms of number of notches. Can you just shed a bit more light on that? Um, yeah, I think um, obviously we need, to, we need to take a certain diligence when we're doing um, our analysis. And, um, and um, as, as mentioned with the example before, actually some of the developments had been a kind of back and forth. So, it wasn't really um, quite um, quite predictable what's going to happen to, to those consolidations and, and actually this example of CAM is actually quite a good one because the first um, were supposed to be part of one of the SIPs then they were actually um, they were taken out of that SIP, they were on a standalone basis obviously they hadn't been able um, to survive on their own so clearly there was quite a dynamic and I think we didn't um, we were of the view that, that it isn't fair really to, um, to adjust really on an almost weekly basis um, the, um, the ratings as a result of those vagaries that had been out and that's why uh, we voluntarily waited until we have come to a relatively steady state and uh, where we can say now we should see some more rating stability going forward in those ratings. Okay, well, Carl, that's been very helpful. You've provided a lot of color to the recent actions on which, as you said, you, know, you will have published as well if you will need to read about that further. But for the moment, Carla, thank you very much.